everyone my name is Eva Lupine welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today I want to talk about something that I think is pretty closely related at least it could be to a lot of the subjects we have been covering recently on this channel talking about abusive dynamics, telling BDSM from abuse, and what I want to talk about is privacy in BDSM relationships, focusing on submission and privacy. What are the expectations there in terms of the BDSM community, individual relationships, how that compares to the vanilla world, and just some general considerations for basically balancing safety and having the sort of BDSM dynamic that you want. That's kind of what I want to focus on. And it's really interesting because I think privacy, like honesty and trust are sort of core tenets maybe that we think about when we have relationships. I think it's curious because in vanilla relationships, for example, just like average dating relationships, the way that we relate to privacy and jealousy, I think is very interesting. So let's start there as sort of like a counterpoint for talking about how like privacy plays out in BDSM in particular compared to like maybe what's standard for the average relationship. So in the vanilla world, I think there's a lot of romanticization that happens of jealousy where it's like, it's cute when your partner is jealous or if they're not jealous, it means that they don't really care about you, that they don't love you, right? And so jealousy is kind of seen as a positive affirmation of a person's investment in the relationship and how much they really care about you. And the way that this can play out, I think in my mind, can result in an invasion of privacy being normalized, right? People talk about like checking their partner's emails and their DMs on their social media accounts. And they talk about, you know, not having passwords with their partners, right? So like their phone is always unlocked and that there shouldn't be any sort of separation where a partner might have the ability to hide something from their partner as a way of like alleviating any sort of potential feelings about like, oh, what if they're talking to somebody else? What if they're cheating on me? And it's sort of a way to like prove that that's not happening besides just trusting your partner that they're not doing those things, right? And with this, I think it's, I, I, can, I can kind of see the desire to do that, to have just complete transparency, like in a positive way, right? Where it's like, I just want full transparency. I want to be able to trust my partner completely and because I have nothing to hide. I have nothing that would ever cause a problem. Like I, I have no reason to like hide my emails or my DMs or, or my phone or my computer passwords from them. It's just not even something that I would be worried about. However, coming from like a BDSM and especially polyamorous perspective, there's, issues with that, right? Like if you're consensually, ethically non-monogamous and you have multiple partnerships, it suddenly makes a lot less sense to give away all of these passwords and all of this information to other partners because it's no longer just about you and that partner, right? It's about you and that partner and a different partner who probably expects some degree of privacy in their relationship with you, right? When they share intimate things with you, when they share secrets, when they talk about like traumatic events that happened in their life, they're not necessarily expecting your other partners also going to be able to obtain that information. So even in a vanilla sort of scope between monogamy and polyamory, there are differences in how we think about privacy. And even in polyamory, there are certainly some people that take it to an extreme where like, it should be okay to completely share all passwords and conversations. And when you have dates, like your other partner is like in the same room while it's happening or when you're doing a Skype call with somebody or Discord chat or whatever, like they're still right there. That's supposed to be okay because it's all for that sake of transparency. It all goes back to transparency, alleviation of jealousy, those sorts of feelings. Now, in the BDSM community, I think we can also have 
those values as well, right? We want that transparency. And it even goes a step farther, I think, in BDSM because when it comes to power exchange and the privacy that the submissive might have, it can be seen as almost a detriment to power exchange to have space for privacy because the idea is, is like, doms aren't mind readers and the best way to have the best BDSM relationship is to know everything about that person. And the more walls that you have up, the less access to information that a dominant has, the less they can really, really deeply know you to have the scenes and the dynamic that maybe you want to have. It can also be a power exchange thing in and of itself, right? Where it's a control aspect, where it's it's sort of like the emotional equivalent of being stripped naked, right? Where you're just, you're completely exposed. Everything is out there. They can do anything that they want with any of your information and you have to be able to trust them that they're going to respect that, especially because it doesn't go in both directions. In a vanilla, even poly situation, if there is that expectation of like, complete transparency, it typically goes both ways. At least most of the time it does. That's the ideal. Whereas in BDSM, there tends to be a very bold line between the privacy that a dominant partner has and the privacy that a submissive partner has. Because usually, I don't know of any relationships at least, where it's equivalent in that way, right? The submissive usually doesn't have access to all of these things because it would go against the flow of the power exchange. So instead, all of the transparency, all the vulnerability that comes from that is placed on the submissive partner. And in fact, I've seen it argued in some spaces where, you know, people are more MS, more master and slave, TPE relationship focused, that a slave, like, just outright does not have a right to privacy of any kind because they're property, they're owned. So anything that they have is technically the master's. Their email address is their master's email address. Their social media is really their master's social media. And I can see how that plays into a certain fantasy. And I never want to yuck anybody's yum and tell them, you know, how they should be doing their kink. But I do want to bring up some legitimate concerns that I think people don't always realize or concretely think about when they are developing these kinds of dynamics because people do tend to focus on the rosy side of it with it being better for building the relationship and, and, and it really sort of, I think for a lot of people, being a manifestation of like the sheer level of trust that you have in a partner. Now, I may at some point make a video about this, but there was somebody who wrote a series of books giving advice on how to create BDSM relationships. Their name is Master M. Hatter. I don't feel weird about sharing that part of it at least, but they do have books. I have read them. And there are things to discuss in many different parts of that book that I'm like, I don't know if that's great, but there was always one thing in there that completely stuck out to me, which is the suggestion that the submissive should always share all of their passwords, phone, email, computer, everything that should be completely transparent, even journals. Now, I haven't mentioned this yet, but, you know, usually even if people are talking about, you know, sharing phone and email and that kind of stuff, they're not usually thinking about like, what is typically considered truly private correspondence, like a locked journal, for example. In this writing, they did suggest basically having a journal that is created with the intention for the master to be able to read it whenever they please write. The idea is they're supposed to be able to speak freely, but knowing that it could be read at any time and that the master has the ability to request at any time to access anything that the submissive has uh, you know, again, with the ideal being that it's because it's about like furthering the dynamic. Well, as it would turn out, there have been abuse allegations against Master M. Hatter. This happened, I want to say, in like 2018, 2019, somewhere in there. Not the abuse itself, but the allegations came out around that time. And they're mostly on FetLife. It's really hard to find. So, you know, I can't really share a lot of information here because FetLife has like very strict rules about sharing information from their website. But Suffice to say, it's on Fat Life. It's something that happened, and uh, you know he had had past relationships. He was also poly, so these were sometimes 
multiple of them happening at once. He had relationships where this privacy was violated and used as a tool for abuse. And moreover, it was a space where they were not safe asking for help because they knew any form of communication that they had with anyone else in the community was monitored and could be checked by this person at any time, right? They couldn't contact people over FetLife because they had that password or their email or text messages. So the only way that they could really communicate to people about what was going on was like, <laughs> in-person, voice-only communication, and hopefully for some reason they had been able to get away from that partner for long enough to be able to have this private information shared that they were like, you know, experiencing this abuse. And, and that's really the dangerous part, right? Is we hopefully are getting into relationships, especially when they're at this level of kink and, and they can be really intense. We're getting into relationships with people that we can trust and that doesn't always work out. That doesn't always work out. Somebody, you know, I think we learned this really from the Marilyn Manson situation. Somebody can put on a really great front, right? They can literally pretend to be the quote, perfect boyfriend, right? In this case, the perfect dom. And abusers, especially really, really experienced, really dangerous abusers, they know how to put that shit on for as long as they need to and they can go back to it whenever they need to because that's the tools that they use to draw you in. And so you always have to be careful. I'm not saying everybody is an abuser. I'm just saying this is something in particular to be cautious of with a power exchange dynamic is somebody can, you know, put up a front, seem like the perfect partner, seem like they're everything that you want them to be, say all the right things, talk to you in all the right ways. You can even have scenes together and those can go really, really well. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to turn over that level of power right away because, you know, we do everything online, right? Our bank accounts, you know, paying our, our, our bills and our loans, like all of, all of that is online through the internet for a lot of us. And so you're not only giving up your private communications, you are potentially giving up work documentation, you're giving up bank account information, your social security number, like who knows, like it can go in a really extreme direction just because of like how much communication happens in places that are accessible to somebody that has access to all of your passwords and that's the expectation. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I'm not saying that it's a bad thing to be open with your partners. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have this be something that you personally want in your relationship as a goal. What I am saying is be cautious about the people you do it with and when you decide to add it into your relationship, just like any style of BDSM, right? Be that financial domination, service, pet play, whatever, it doesn't matter. I really think always the best plan for multiple reasons is to incorporate that thing incrementally into your dynamic, right? So don't give up your password to your, you know, bank <laughs> is the first step, right? Don't give up everything all at once, but maybe they have their own password for entering your phone for example, or you do the journal thing, right? Where you do write a journal and they have access to it at any time. Uh, you know, I, I think if you're trying to reflect on an abusive relationship, you know, and try to figure out like in your brain, you know, am I experiencing abuse? Because people think that like abuse is obvious and like it's really easy to figure out. Like it can take a long time of reflection, talking to other partners, other people in your life, friends in the community to understand like, oh, actually this thing, really isn't okay and I've been justifying it to myself, right? And a journal can be a helpful tool for working through that. So the journal thing can also be like, mm, maybe not the best thing to start with, but that also doesn't mean you can't keep like your own like second private journal, right? So maybe the journal thing can be a good way of building trust and building the dynamics. I think that's the clearest one of all of the sort of, you know, privacy options for a thing that I do think can really build a relationship to be able to see exactly how your partner is processing things after aftercare, after a really intense scene, that is really helpful. So that would be where I would start and then see how that person treats that information, see how they use it, see how they use their power before you decide to give more to them. Similarly to how you would do with financial domination, with service, all of that, see how it goes and add things in slowly because 
if things start to go really wrong, it's a lot easier to pump the brakes when you've only done one or two things and most of your information is still private as opposed to doing everything all at once because if somebody does mean you harm, and this is where it gets really, really bad, like this is like I think the most horrific implication, is if somebody does have access to all of your information and they turn out to be abusive or if you just want to like break up with them and end the relationship and they are not okay with that, you know, they are, are, are literally like holding your identity by the throat at that point where they're like, look, I have access to all of your contacts, your phone. I could literally, you know, do you want me to like send pictures of you on a St. Andrew's cross to your mom and your boss? Like it is like, whoo, like if somebody wants to, they can use that information for, for blackmail, for opening credit cards in your name, like depending on how much you share and what, like it, it should be taken with a, a, a pretty big grade of salt when you decide to go in, in that direction. And so to just sort of push back on the idea that like, you know, real submissives, real slaves don't, you know, have privacy or whatever, like, again, you can have that fantasy, you can build a relationship in that direction, but you need to be cautious how you do it. And if that is your ideal, right? If you're thinking, I'm in an MS relationship. This is what I want. I want my partner to own everything about me totally and completely. You know, the reason I have a phone is with their permission, right? You can build up to that. I think people get the impression you leap into these things with both feet and you just go for it and that's the only way to do it. Absolutely not. It is totally valid to take your DS journey slow. And I think the more and more that I'm personally learning about all of these abusive experiences and even the tendency for, for, very small things to go in a toxic direction, the more I, I am truly set in my conviction that slow is best, slow is best. And you know, this even goes for existing partnerships when you happen to maybe move from a vanilla relationship into a BDSM one or from a monogamous one into a poly one. If there is just a change in the dynamic, you know, you can know somebody for, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but when the circumstances change, their behavior might change and they might start to act in irrational ways because of that. So keep that in mind as well. Like I think having a base of trust with a partner you've known for a really, really long time does mitigate a lot of this versus meeting a new partner you maybe want to engage in these things with, but it doesn't get rid of all the potential problems when you are doing something that's totally new for the relationship, regardless of how old and, and, how long it's been existing for. And I think if you're submissive, if you're somebody that has been told they need to give up their privacy, that true submissives, true slaves, you know, would share all of this stuff, that is bullshit. That is absolutely and totally, totally bullshit. There is no one way to be a submissive, no one way to be a slave. And, you know, if somebody tells you that, then great. They're not compatible with you. You can move on, you can find somebody else that aligns with your values in that regard. But, you know, BDSM is a really intense thing. I, I think if you want to, you should absolutely have a right to privacy for any reason you want, because you want to have a private place to process, because you're in a line of work that absolutely cannot overlap with BDSM, like any reason, totally valid, and you're allowed to say, no, actually, I think I want to maintain my separation and my privacy that's really important to me, and you have a right to find partners that are of a similar mind to you on that if that is what you want to have. So don't feel bad about whatever choice that you make. Don't let people tell you <laughs> that like, <laughs> because you don't want to give up your bank account information, you're not a real submissive. Like people say the craziest stuff online about like real BDSM relationships versus fake submissives and like most of it's just entirely bullshit. So you can, you can just brush that off. Don't really worry about it. Do what works for you. That's really the moral of all of these stories is do what works for you. Don't listen to people that are trying to pressure you into doing something that you are not comfortable with. And, you know, I, I think privacy as a concept in BDSM is not something that we give enough respect to, I think, in terms of how intense it is. It seems so simple to be like, yeah, my password on my phone is 2266. And you don't realize exactly, I think, sometimes how much you have truly consented to give up when you have handed it over, you know, maybe not fully informed consent, but like you've given them your phone and so they can, they can do a lot of damage with that information and pictures and, and other things if they, if they so choose. Uh, and, and if you're in a place where you feel like 
you need to have that from a partner because you can't trust them otherwise, that is a whole other red flag, right? If you're thinking, you know, my partner's cheated on me in the past, they've done something that's violated my boundaries, so the only way that I can feel safe being a partner with them is if they give up all this information to me. I would just say, if you need that to recover in the relationship, I would I would just really seriously think, do you actually want to continue that relationship if your trust is so damaged that your partner like can't have a private email? You know, I feel like maybe you're not at the place with that person to to go back into a relationship with them. That would be my perspective on it. I am sure there are experts that you know lots more about that than I do that probably have different opinions, but that's just my quick little hot take on that. But I think it's everything that I wanted to share today. I'm just, I'm feeling really passionate about issues related to abuse and creating healthy dynamics. You guys are probably gonna see a lot of videos like this one, uh, you know, in the future on my channel in the next couple of weeks. Who knows, maybe I'll get bored of it, but that's what I have to say for now. I would love to hear your thoughts, your opinions, your experiences down in the comment section below. For example, what sort of dynamic do you have with privacy in your relationships? Is it something where you have completely given up control? Have you had negative or positive experiences with us? I would love to hear other people's perspectives and opinions, so go ahead and leave that down in the comment section below. Anything else you wanna ask me, you can go ahead and leave it down there as well. If you really like this, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. And also, if you really enjoyed this, if you wanna support what I do, please go ahead and check out my Patreon. That is what makes all of this possible. The reason I have been able to do like hour and a half long deep dives into <laughs> Marilyn Manson and everything else is because of Patreon. So if you want to keep seeing videos like that one as well, please go ahead and check out Patreon below. Tons of other exclusive perks and rewards, bonus videos, monthly photo shoots, a Discord chat, lots of fun things like that. So please go ahead, check it out down below. If you already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.